Father, as we receive your word into our hearts and minds this morning, Father, that it would bring forth great prosperity and wealth, not just financially, but emotionally, relationally, psychologically, in our work environment, Lord God, in every dimension of our life. Father, I declare and I decree according to Isaiah chapter 60, Lord God, when darkness covers the earth and deep darkness the people, that it is then that you will arise over your people. Father, I thank you right now that this is the hour where you are beginning to arise over your church and arise over your people, oh God, that your glory will be seen, oh God. Father, that the plowman will overtake the reaper, that seven men will grab one man and say, how can I be saved? Father, prepare us, oh God, as we look with expectation to what is ahead and the season we are in. In Jesus' name, amen. When you look at Matthew chapter 24, you can see a progression of events. Now, this morning, I'm not going to preach on this topic, but stage one, nation will rise up against nation. Stage two, you. Look at your neighbors, say you. That means the church will, will come under persecution. Amen. We know that the church in China, we know that the church in various nations is already under persecution. But the church in the West has not faced persecution yet. Amen. So we know that one of the stages that will come is that the church, we the church, will have to face persecution. Verse 10, it says, stage 3, many will be offended because of the gospel. And because of that offense, they will betray one another. Stage 4, many false prophets will arise and deceive many. Stage 5, global lawlessness. Amen. Stage 6, this gospel shall prevail. Look at your neighbor, say the end is good. With God, it always ends good. Amen. He says, no matter what is happening, there is something that cannot be killed. It cannot be slaughtered. It cannot be quenched. It cannot be quieted. This gospel shall prevail. Amen. Let me share with you this morning a, a phrase that I saw, and I want you just to think about it. Deception is like this. It is hiding in plain sight. That is one of the most profound little terms that I believe describes the, the mandate and describes the operation of a spirit of deception. Deception hides in plain sight. It's right there for everybody to see, but yet it cannot be seen. It is right there out in the open, but yet invisible. It is visible, but yet not visible. And when I look at what is happening globally, especially when we look over the last three weeks about what has been happening with Egypt, I believe that in this hour we have to really not just be concerned with our own little lives, but begin to understand what God is doing on a global scale from a prophetic um, perspective. I believe right now, not just I believe, I believe prophetic um, Daniel and the prophetic books point to let us know that as we sit here in Montego Bay right now, that the Antichrist is alive in the earth. He has already been born and he is sh being shaped and formed and fashioned in the diabolical womb of the mindset of the devil to begin to emerge. Prophecy tells us in Joel and in Zechariah that as this Antichrist begins not to be in hiding but begins to emerge at a global level. You see, what will happen, Zechariah and Joel tells us this, that Israel will be divided again, that the land of Israel will be split again, that they will enter into a peace agreement. It tells us that peace agreement will last for three years. The Bible also tells us that Jerusalem, the, the actual capital city of Israel, will also be divided again. It will happen. And that there will be a global government 
that will try to set up their rule and reign. How many of you know Satan always tries to imitate? Amen. God's plan is that Jesus would return again. That he would turn, return and out of Jerusalem, that he will rule and reign the nations for a period of time where the lion will lay down with the lamb. That it is out of Jerusalem that God has established the rule of his son to take place on earth. So guess where the enemy is after? Hello? Come on now, church. He's after Jerusalem. So the Bible tells us that before the end, before the second coming of Jesus Christ, this man of sin, this antichrist will emerge. And I believe he's in the earth. And I believe we would be surprised. Amen? Deception, one of the things about the sting of deception is that many times they're hiding in plain sight. One of the things about the sting of deception, you say, it could never be so, but it is so. And see, we know that out of Jerusalem, this global government would set, would set up their government in Jerusalem on that temple mound in order to rule and reign the nations, amen, by re and also reject the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Pastor Mary, why are you saying this? As a body of Christ, we have to begin to be aware that it says in the last days, one of the things that's going to happen is there is going to be a mind-blinding spirit that is going to be released at a global level to deceive many. But this spirit of deception is one of the most wicked. It is Satan's master tool. The Bible says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But deception is the tool in which he exercises his mandate. His mandate is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And it says in Revelation 12, verse 9, says this, that old serpent, the devil, Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. It's his master tool. To deceive, not just the church, not just the unbelievers, but to deceive the whole world. Jesus says this, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The spirit of deception is completely diametrically opposed to the spirit of truth. And one of the ways that the enemy uses deception, because it's hiding in plain sight, the enemy does not walk into your life or into your face or into your home or into your family and say, well, you know, I want to tell you a lie. It's really not true, but. One of the ways he deceives is by being desensitizing us to truth. Amen? And so deception presents a lie as truth. Amen? And this is a sting. I don't know how many of you have been ever deceived in your life. You've faced deception at certain levels. There is a deception that other people can bring to you, but I believe the one of the most, the deception that has the greatest sting is when you become self-deceived. Now this morning I want us to understand, I want to paint a picture for you this morning and to really begin to unpack one of the ways that this deception begins to work. There is a type of person, and I feel like beginning to shout, <laughs> that is being incubated in the womb of the enemy in this generation and dispensation. Is a type of person that the enemy wants to birth forth into the earth. And Timothy here is writing. He's not writing to the heathen. He's writing to the church. And he's saying to the church, beware. Be careful. Many times we say these things are attacking somebody else. But I want to tell you, I need to beware. 
that these things do not creep into my household, into my marriage, into my mind, into my heart, into this church, into my family. He says, this is a type of person that is being incubated in the womb of the enemy, a generation that he wants to bring forth into manifestation. And we must begin to recognize the pull. Look at your neighbor. Slap your neighbor. Hit them on the head. Kick them in the knee. Say, you must be able to recognize the pull. It is a pull uh, that the enemy brings into our life. A pull that begins to work on our mind and work on our thought process and work on our heart. And this pull is to pull us into a mindset. He says here, he begins to list some things. Lovers of money, lovers of self, boasters, proud, blasphemous, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. There are four uns. <laughs> Amen. Nothing's ever good enough. There's no gratitude. He says they're slanders without self-control, brutal dis despisers of good. Look at your neighbor say, don't get caught in the incubation womb of the enemy. One of the things we have to understand why it's so important to be reconnected to our Jewish roots is to understand that a Jew thinks different than a Westerner. Come on now, look at your neighbor say, you as a Westerner. We're Westerners. They think differently. When you, many times when you talk to Westerners and you say this, God is altogether love, but he's altogether justice. You see, many times people say they have, go on the internet, they have debate after debate after debate after debate after debate. How can God be altogether love? That's why the New Age movement was birthed. Amen? You got to just love. Love is everything. Love is about the flesh. No. Love. Can you come here, Pastor Rowan, for a second? Amen? And John. Nikki, can you help me? Just hold the mic. Can you hold this hand? Just hold my mic here. If God is altogether love, pull on my side. Amen? And God is also altogether justice and righteousness and truth. Love cannot be love without justice. Meaning I cannot love Aleah and never discipline her. If I never discipline Aleah, I do not love her. Amen. If I never bring righteous correction in her life, it means I do not love her. Meaning God says discipline is good for us. Amen. And one of the things that is so hard for us as Westerners is to pull on me, is to begin to realize that God is a God that holds the universe in balance. And it means to hold the universe in balance. He is righteous. He is justice. He is truth. He brings judgment. He, you know, God can even release courage is on our life in order to bring us back into relationship with him. Everything has to be held in balance. Amen. A Jew understands that. 